Citizen Soldiers, Militia and Militia Men. I'm Brooks Lyles. I am with the uh, Sons of the American Revolution, the Battle of Kings Mountain chapter, the North Carolina Society, and I'm the Education Committee Chairman. This is my wife, Diana Barsky, and we're here today to do a presentation on militias and militiamen. An overview of the militia system. Militiamen made up a far greater quantity of those who served during the Revolutionary War than Continental troops. Each colony had a militia, and each town or county had a militia of some sort. Militias started being formed uh, very early in our time in North America as local protection against uh, raiding parties from other colonies, other nationalities, and from the local natives who may have been opposing um, a settlement or an expansion of, of land holdings. So each colony had their own militia and they were trained and equipped uh, along the coast as uh, based on the British model. As tensions grew between uh, the colonies and the mother country and it started to become evident that uh, war was likely or a possibility. Uh, militias were expanded. Uh, the training of the militias picked up and they trained a little more often. And as the English saw this and started cutting off supplies of uh, powder and uh, weapons to the colonies, the colonies looked at to other places. They looked to other uh, European powers. They looked to the Caribbean um, as sources of uh, weapons and equipment. But each colony had a militia law and every free male within the, the militia had to serve, sometimes as young as 15. Each of the colonies had their own different sets of rules and laws applying to the militia. In Virginia, the ages were 18 to 50, and militias were formed by the county. In Massachusetts, the ages were 16 to 60, and militias were formed by the towns. A Minuteman is an elite group of militiamen. They were not uh, uh, somebody that uh, was special or was not, uh, they, they were special, but they were trained and drilled much more regularly than a common militia. They were the quick reaction force of the day. Uh, the militias in Virginia, as I said, were organized by counties. They mustered and drilled every two weeks and they held a general muster twice a year, once in April and once in October. Uh, in New Jersey, uh, the call up was for two months, but varied situationally. Um, Sometimes in, uh, in New Jersey, actually, it was every other month. I'm dressed today as a common colonist, a mechanic in New England, a farmer uh, in New England. Somebody dressed like this would be someone who lived uh, along the coast, closer to the, uh, the port cities, closer to where you would be able to buy and, and wear um, clothing imported from England. Uh, as a militiaman, uh, I would have equipment and items that were uh, imported rather than made at home. So they were uh, items that were available through the ports, mostly English made, in some cases French, Dutch, or Spanish made but predominantly uh, things imported from the mother country. And what, what you would do, you're wearing what you wear, but you have a very short time to react and move to, uh, gathering at the town square or wherever, wherever the approved gathering place is. So you basically, the first thing you would do is head in. The first thing you're gonna grab is your haversack. The haversack was like the man purse of the day or the backpack of the day. You carried all of your necessaries in here. Things like uh, 
you had the time, you could bring a notebook, um, your uh, knife, fork, and spoon, your little mess kit, those kind of things would go in your haversack. Haversack goes over the left shoulder. Next thing you're going to grab would be your cartridge box. And a cartridge box uh, would be something that would be on the, the, again, the militia on the east would have uh, produced things. Uh, you would have your cartridges, that's a paper cartridge, powder, ball, tied off, and you would carry 30, between 20 and 30, depending on the unit and what you were carrying. So, the cartridge box goes on. You would have a manufactured canteen. This is a tin canteen, uh, imported, British made. Uh, it's a little fancy, it's called a kidney canteen. It's got a curvature on the back. That goes over one shoulder to the rear. You've got, uh, if you're carrying a brown vest, we'll talk about the brown vest in a second, you may have a bayonet. If you have a bayonet, that would go up and go over the other shoulder, opposite your cartridge box. You would ditch your mop cap or your local cap, go to your tricorn or flat cap, depending on what it is you, you would normally wear or carry. Grab your pick and brush, which are basic tools of a, a rifleman or a musketman that's worn over, your, uh, over a button or hung off your cartridge box. And the primary weapon would have been a brown vest. And a brown vest musket is a 75 caliber musket. It's imported from England. They have a variety of models. Uh, the Model 1 would have been the older model. The Brown Best is a 75 caliber musket. It's a smooth bore. It is accurate only out to, for aimed fire, only out to about 100, 120 yards. It will kill you at a much longer range. Um, but to be truly uh, accurate with it, and the reason you see um, folks at that time line up in large block formations and stand 50, 60, 70 yards apart and exchange fire is they were inherently inaccurate. As a smooth bore, the ball is not patched. The ball is simply poured down uh, on top of the powder in the barrel. And as it goes out, it's, it's called windage. Is the gases uh, from fire that escape around the ball space between the ball and the diameter of the barrel and that causes the ball to ping a little bit so it could could go straight it could go south it could go east west north basically depending on what it last hit before it left the barrel so to be effective in fire with the brown best you have to fire a large volume of fire and that's why they stood in those block formations uh, this is This is a brown best musket, and this is an actual veteran of the Revolutionary War. It's a part of the SAR collection, but it's what the average uh, militiaman on the uh, old style uh, Eastern uh, units would have carried. Now, a Minuteman may have been equipped uh, and used this, they potentially uh, at the time would have had Danish muskets. If they were veterans of the French and Indian War, they'd be using a musket that they, uh, or a fowler, which is a birding weapon. Uh, potentially rifles, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, rifles were not prominent in the East, but the uh, imported weapons from England would have been the primary weapon. So, process for loading. You know, they always talk about one of the things, to be a soldier in the Continental Army you had to have at least two teeth and they had to be opposite of each other. So when you were loading your weapon, 
you could bite the paper off of your cartridge. So you bite, you pour, first you prime, then you pour down the barrel, then you put the ball, and then you ram. I'm not going to do that with the round bass, since that is a very old and special member of the uh, SAR Museum collection. Uh, the other things you would have to, might have to take with you would be a bedroll or a blanket. But this is basically what a Minuteman would grab. Um, things, they would be hung by the door at the ready, and you would take that and get out to the, uh, to the village green as quickly as possible. So when you see, you talk about Lexington and Concord on the village green with Captain Parker, you look at the SAR statue of the Minuteman or what's on our logo, that is the quintessential um, militiamen of the early part of the war. Okay? Now, the transition um, from a Minuteman to a regular militiaman would be uh, you're a little further from the big cities, you're further from areas that you would have to be alerted quickly, and your, the, the uh, type, type equipment you would carry is going to alter a little bit. So rather than a cartridge box and a brown vest and a shiny silver uh, kidney canteen that you would have, you may be going to a different type of canteen, you may be going to a different um, type of weapon. Uh, a long rifle, you would have a powder horn. So we're going to demonstrate some of the uh, the shifting or some of the different things that one might have. Okay. And when getting switched, you always have to take things off in the order in which you put them opposite that you put them on. Because the straps get very intertangled. Now the haversack, we're going to keep that. The haversack would probably be something you may, you would find in, in different areas. But a potential, this would be a different model uh, cartridge box. This is a brown leather one with a canvas strap, vice a leather strap. We're not, going, we're not going to put that on. I'm sort of pointing out some of the differences. Um, if you were well-to-do, you were one of the, uh, a, a gentleman of uh, some merit, you may have a pistol. So these are flintlock pistols. This is a 54 caliber uh, pistol. They are normally not worn in holsters as you see today in our military and others, either in a shoulder holster or a hip holster. These would have been predominantly uh, are known as horse uh, pistols and they would have been in holsters on either side of the saddle the front of your horse. You'd have different types of uh, horns, uh, different powder may be used in the pistol. So you would have uh, potentially a brass uh, horn with a measure on it or a smaller horn to be used for the pistol. The pistols were one shot. So when you fired the one shot you got your one shot in, then it turned around and became a club. So for close-in fighting, that's one of the brass. These were pretty solid. It makes a good cudgel. It's about the same size uh, as an Indian war club and can be used just as effectively. All right, so as I'm transitioning from um, the militia on the coast and moving further inland, what you see is the type of equipment becomes more of those kind of things that you would make your own. You would uh, be slightly less formal. And an example of that would be sort of the clothing they wear. Rather than a fine white cotton shirt, you'd be wearing an a Osnenberg uh, homespun linen shirt. And this shirt is not quite a hunting frock, but it could uh, basically be worn there at this length. Uh, this would be worn over trousers or over leggings in the Indian style. The, 
we are going to switch over and go to the Eastern style a little bit, or Western, more Western style. Uh, hunting frock. So this would be sort of your overcoat. You may or may not wear a waist, waistcoat or a waist, waistcoat under it, but you would wear that, and that is your outer garment. You would wear a sash, and that could be worn in different, different ways, uh, either doubled up and tied in the back, or as, as a little less formal, just kind of hanging like that. Your equipment, rather than the fancy metal, uh, rather than the fancy metal uh, canteens, you could have a wooden canteen, and this one is, and then guys would do a lot of uh, decorating of their stuff, so painting of their canteens, painting of their uh, rucksacks and, and haversacks or embroidery on their clothing. This canteen represents my ancestors' unit, so it's Penn's Rifles, Henry County, uh, which is in Virginia, and says liberty or death on it. But a wooden canteen is one style canteen they might use. Another type of canteen is a leather canteen. So this is formed, uh, and that's what we're going to wear today. Yeah. So you got to. Water becomes very important. Um, rather than a haversack, you would have an essential sack. Uh, this one happens to be made out of skunk, but it's one of the things you would carry. Rather than your canvas haversack, it'd be something made locally. weapon is a rifle, and a rifle is quite a bit different than a musket, uh, mostly in the time it takes to load it and in the distance and accuracy of it. The problem with rifles is they're slow to load, and what the Indians would do, they were allied with the British, and what the British would do uh, when they run against rifles is they would wait until the rifle would fire and then they would charge. Um, they would tend to get in range and affect you so they uh, they would try to pair riflemen with musket men or work in pairs where you're running two rifles together so they would not uh, couldn't get rushed while they were reloading. Typical headgear could be a tricorn. Uh, as you get again further away, it would more likely be a, a flat brimmed or floppy hat. So we've got uh, basically kitted out. And these are the things that you would find uh, on the frontier, on the far west. Uh, things that are made locally, things that are made from the land. We talked about some of the canteens we were looking at. We had the wooden canteens, the tin canteens, the leather canteen that I'm wearing. This is one of my favorite frontier style canteens. This is a gourd canteen. So this is something you grow, um, your local, local farm out, outside your, uh, your little town or village or out on the frontier. You basically hollow it out and it, once it dries, they can be used uh, as a canteen. The, um, the other thing that you would have, particularly with the requirement for a militiaman on the frontier, is that when you leave, you don't know how long you're going to be gone for. So you would have to take your bedroll with you. Um, a lot of those guys would, uh, basically it's just a blanket roll, but this is, a, is painted canvas, leather, you got your blanket in here, you got a couple of changes of socks, 
uh, anything of that nature. And when you're out there on the frontier, you're on your own. You carry what you need with you. Um, and when you leave, you're, you're dependent upon yourself. You don't have a, a higher headquarters, you don't have a supply column, you don't have people providing logistics and support to you. So whatever you take with you, you carry yourself. Now, we talked a little bit about with the brown bess and the ranges of the brown bess and why um, units that were using brown besses or equipment brown bess stood in formation um, and exchanged fire at close range because of the inaccuracies of that. The German rifle, the Pennsylvania rifle or the Virginia rifle, is a much more accurate weapon. Uh, it can shoot out to 300 yards. Uh, a well-trained rifleman can be accurate predictably at about 200 yards, but the really well-trained guys, the, the sharpshooters, could go out there a, long, a lot longer. Uh, the problem is it takes a lot longer to load. While a well-trained uh, Continental soldier could shoot three to five rounds a minute using his brown best, uh, it's going to take you two to three minutes to load a rifle. So you're trading distance and accuracy for the time required to shoot. The process is a little different. You don't have a cartridge box with pre-made cartridges. You're basically using your powder horn. So the first thing, you go to half cock. When you're in half cock, the weapon won't fire. Now there's a lot of expressions that uh, we know today that found their, uh, originally were founded or used in this day. If you ever heard the expression, don't go off half cocked, that refers to a musket or to a rifle or a musket in the half cock position. It will not fire. So prep for loading, you go to half cock, take your powder horn, you prime the pan, close the pan, load, powder, and it's an eyeball test. It's an eyeball or you have a measuring thing, but if you're taking your time or if you're experienced at it, you would uh, be able to figure out exactly how much powder that goes in there. Then you'll pull your patch. We talk about the patches are either very fine leather or oiled cloth. Patch goes over the barrel, go to your shot bag, you pull a ball, the ball goes in, you start to push it down, and in some cases you'll see part of a person's uh, kit bag will be a starter. So it's a little tool that allows you to punch that in a little bit. Then ramrod, and I'm not going to punch the patch down there. But a ramrod in, because the barrel is rifled, it takes a little more effort to get it loaded, to get it tamped down. You got to put your ramrod back in, because once you shoot, you may have to leave the area quickly and you don't want to run off and forget your ramrod. Then you go full cock. Then you aim and fire. Now, that, I wasn't timing, I don't know how long that took, but probably close to a minute and a half, and I'm not a well-trained rifleman, but that gets into the um, a little demonstration about how much longer it takes to shoot the rifle. The beauty of this is, and the way it was utilized, is to shoot British officers, sergeants, leaders. It was a, uh, we didn't play by the European rules that you would normally find for uh, what was considered uh, the rules of, of warfare, European style warfare. 
officers were not targeted, uh, gentlemen did not um, direct the killing of other officers, but in the South, uh, in the Western areas and on the frontier, um, because we were normally outmanned or outnumbered, we felt the best way to protect our families, to protect our farms, to protect our interests, were to decapitate the uh, British units, kill the leaders, kill the sergeants, um, and that would uh, slow the unit. And British units were well disciplined, but they didn't exercise a lot of initiative. So they were dependent on their officers and sergeants for direction. So when you kill them, you, uh, you even the odds a little bit and put yourself in a better situation. Um, now, just talk a little bit about, uh, about identifying and killing leaders. How, do, uh, how does a militiaman know uh, when uh, one is in charge? Well, the militia are normally from the same hometown, the same county. They know each other. They've worked together. They grew up together. They farm together. So uh, a leader in a militia unit would be uh, the guy who founded the unit, probably a leading citizen in the town, somebody that had the funds to uh, buy equipment, to buy powder, to bring units or bring folks together. Uh, so he was a leader in that community before they formed the militia. Uh, they were normally, or they would then be confirmed by the governor of that colony. The officers within that militia unit would be appointed by that colonel. So a lot of times they were family members. Sometimes they were other, uh, other landowners in the community or other people of importance. Over time, the quality of leadership brought those guys, uh, the quality leaders rose to the top. So to maintain, you may get appointed by the governor or you may be appointed by the local colonel, but if you weren't very good, you didn't hold your position long. So the natural leaders and those people that could uh, make decisions on, the, on their own, uh, used initiative, those were the guys that then would rise to the top and become those local leaders, the Francis Marians and the, uh, the Sumters and the Pinckneys. Uh, the, the Davises, those guys that um, proved over and over again that they could do it. And then the local people would rise to, they would go follow the individual. They would follow somebody based on a reputation. So militias evolved over time from being small local community groups, in some cases to being uh, little mobile traveling forces. The there were a lot of opinions, a lot of thoughts about the quality of militia. And they tended to be, when working on their own, they did better than they did when working with the regular army, with the Continental Army. Because the Continental Army was very structured, had a very detailed command, uh, chain of command. And when people told somebody to do something, they expected it to be done. When a continental general or a continental colonel told a militia colonel to do something, they didn't always do it the way that the army guys, the continentals would have expected them to do it. And a lot of times militia locals would come to the army to volunteer and as soon as they got their equipment, they'd get a weapon, some powder and a new set of shoes or something, they would turn around that night and go home. So it was very hard for the Continental Army to count on the militia, but when the militia was used properly, like Daniel Morgan at the Battle of Calpins, uh, they could be quite effective. Uh, we were talking about leadership. How do you tell one militia, how do you tell a, a Patriot militiaman from a Tory militiaman? That was hard because they live in the same neighborhood, you're in the same area, you live, dress, work, do everything the same. So there were different ways of identifying um, whether you were a patriot or uh, a Tory. And for instance, at the Battle of Kings Mountain, uh, the Tories put uh, twigs of pine in their hats and the colonials or the, the uh, patriots put a piece of white paper. So while you're 
in the woods, in the trees, fighting, dodging bullets and whatnot, you're looking to make sure the guy you're about to kill has a piece of white paper, doesn't have a piece of white paper in his hat. Make sure he has a twig uh, of, of green or a twig of pine on there. The other thing, the other signs of command, if you were in a unit, like we said, you know the guys from your neighborhood, you know the guys in your unit, so you know that chain of command. Uh, another couple of different ways of showing command would be such things, and I'm going to change hats here, but uh, such things as a marker, uh, a feather. You put something in your hat that indicates that other people can see that uh, indicates you're in a leadership position. This is a what's known as a gorget. It's a goes back to the days of um, knights and body armor, and it was a piece that was worn around the neck. And in its original purpose, it rode up around the neck to protect your neck from sword blows, spears, or whatnot. Uh, by the days of the revolution, they were worn as a um, just a scene of rank or a sign of rank. So this was, uh, if you were a British officer wearing one of these, these are the things that our riflemen would be looking for to aim at. So it's a good way of drawing fire. Another way of, of rank, of indicating rank, would have been with a sash. So the first one I'm wearing here is this green uh, home knit sash. But if you were an officer, you may wear a red sash. You may wear it across your shoulder this way, or you may wear it around your waist uh, with a sword. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of delineating uh, officers or identifying officers from enlisted. How were the militias used? Uh, the militia were not uh, generally known for their willingness or ability to stand shoulder to shoulder in a block formation and trade uh, volleys with British regulars who were equipped with brown besses and and uh, bayonets and were drilled and, and well-trained. Militiamen knew how to shoot. They knew how to fight, but they were used to doing it in small groups. And the regular army officers knew that they could not rely on the militia in a stand-up fight, but they could use the militia to take care of those missions those um, combat support, combat service support, logistics, uh, and security things that would free up the regular soldiers to fight in their continental line uh, as in, in their stand-up force. So typical militia missions might be guarding of supply depots, uh, guarding of uh, crops and supplies, escorting prisoners of war, uh, escorting supply convoys and logistics uh, operations. They could reinforce the Continental Army when the Continental Army was operating within their area. They would, uh, each state was tasked to provide quotas of men and supplies to the Continental Army and the governors would then pass those uh, taskings down to the counties and the counties to the towns and they would have to provide a certain percentage of men and supplies to support the Continental Army when it was operating. Uh, they were an armed police force. Uh, they were ensuring uh, compliance with the uh, rules and regulations of the new government. Tory or loyalist suppression was a big mission of the, uh, of the militia. They were policing their towns and they were keeping an eye on those that were opposed to the national government uh, and the Continental Congress. Those on the Western frontier had the mission of um, protecting the frontier from the Native Americans uh, that were allied with the uh, British, uh, either from British led operations against the frontier or from just uh, the normal raids that were taking place uh, when the traditional lands of the Indians were being uh, infringed upon. 
They would hunt for deserters, those that had gone off to serve in the Continental Army and had taken uh, an enlistment bonus or pledged a one-year or three-year uh, service and then deserted, uh, went back home. They had to be found and returned to the Army. And they would administer loyalty oaths. Uh, that was one of the things that went back and forth. Uh, when the British would come into the area, they would go out and try to get people to take a, a loyalty oath to the crown. And when the British would leave and the Continentals would come back through, one of the things they would do is getting loyalty oaths back, uh, get people to sign oaths back to support Continental Congress. All right, there's a lot of, there was a lot of tension uh, in the day between the militias and the Continental Army. Uh, talk a little bit about the attitudes toward the militia. Uh, New Jersey, Governor Livingston described the militia laws of the state as placing an inordinate burden on the willing. What he meant by that is that those that were willing to serve were being ground down. They were being called up far too often and there was a large percentage of the population that was doing nothing while uh, the militia guys were being uh, worn to a nub. George Washington, our commander in chief, if I were called upon to declare whether the militia had been most serviceable or hurtful upon the whole, I should subscribe to the latter. That is not a ringing endorsement of the, uh, of the militia and their service under George Washington. Nathaniel Green, who worked with an army in the Southern campaign that was predominantly militia, stated that militiamen soon get tired out with the difficulties and go and come in such irregular bodies that I can make no calculation on the strength of my army. He also said, I think it is an endless task to attempt to arm and equip the militia for you may depend upon it. Such will never be useful in this hour of difficulty. Those statements uh, are from several of our most respected uh, leaders of the Continental Army. So it gives you an idea of what the regular army thought about the citizen soldiers and about our national, what would be the equivalent today of our National Guard. However, those attitudes changed over time. General Lord Charles Cornwallis, I will not say much in praise of the militia in the Southern colonies, but the list of British officers and soldiers killed and wounded by them since last June proves but too fatally that they are not wholly contemptible. Now that's sort of faint praise or, but it acknowledges the way the militia fight, particularly in the back country. And finally, as General Nathaniel Green came to appreciate the militia uh, as he fought his uh, battles through the South, uh, across the Dan, back to Guilford Courthouse and, and on to Utah Springs, the militia in the back country are formidable. You cannot deny that uh, the militia when well-led and when used the way they should be, can be quite effective and were, uh, were effective in the South. Now, Daniel Morgan, uh, the commander of Green's Flying Army and the, the man who won the Battle of Calpins, was one of the few people who knew the militia having served as a militiaman, uh, a wagoneer during the French and Indian War, a ranger, uh, on the frontier in the later stages of that, and uh, a campaign campaigner on the frontier uh, in the Virginia uh, militia. He had worked with Washington at various times. He understood the militia and how to properly use them. John Buchanan, the author of the uh, Road to Guilford Courthouse, 
talks about Daniel Morgan and says this untutored son of the frontier was the only general in the American Revolution on either side to produce a significant original tactical thought. At the Battle of Calpins in the morning of January 17th, Morgan deployed his men in three main lines of defense. He knew the militia had a tendency to run. Therefore, when selecting his uh, battle position, the, deciding to fight at the Calpins, he selected ground that was, had a river to its back. It had a swamp and heavy trees on either side. And he knew that that was going to force the militia uh, to be a little uh, less inclined to run. Um, in doing that and knowing the militia tendencies and their uh, desire to run when things got hot, he divided them into two groups, placed the sharpshooters on the top of the general rise and ordered them to fire twice, then retreat back behind the second line. The second line were positioned behind the crest of a hill and they were to fire twice and then retreat behind the Continentals who were 150 yards behind them. Morgan knew he could count on the Continentals to take the hardest part of the fight and that they would not run. Now, what Morgan did was he walked around, he spent the night before the battle walking around to the different camps and campfires and explaining to the militiamen what it was they were expected to do, why they were expected to do it, and he expressed his confidence in their ability to do what he was asking them to do. And the, the line that is attributed to him is that I need you to fire twice. You know, Bloody Ban is out there. He doesn't have any respect for you. He's going to charge in uh, and expect you to run. But I want you to fire twice. And once you do that and move back and take up your second position and fire twice from there and then move back, you can go home and tell the ladies about what a, the ladies and girls about what a hero you were at the Battle of Calpins. And the final question is, could we have won the war without the militia? And I think that's an unequivocal no. The, uh, the militia were integral to our success. The militia are, they are the Americans. They are who we are, citizen soldiers willing to go out and fight to protect our, our country, our hearts, our homes. Our, our families, and America would not be who we are today without the contributions of the militia, our citizen soldiers. Here are some of the references that we used um, in putting this together. Militiamen, how they were used, where they fought, the campaigns in the southern, uh, or the battles and campaigns in the south which is where the militia uh, truly uh, made themselves felt. Uh, there's also several good books about uh, frontier militia up in New York and, uh, and on the New England campaigns. <laughs>